Before the episode, we have a special thank you to some of our Patreon supporters. Thank you to Chelsea, Elaine, Amy, Lauren, Ashley, and Courtney. If you didn't know, Patreon is actually the main way that we fund the things that are happening at the Sartorial Geek. So Patreon funds this podcast and the fees that go into hosting and editing. It keeps the website up and running. It helps us pay for the magazine. Um, And that's the main way that we can fund the things that are happening here that isn't just Liz and I funding it ourselves. So we appreciate everyone who is a part of our Patreon so, so much. I don't think that I can accurately explain how much we appreciate you. Um, So thank you to everyone who has already joined. And if you want to see the rewards and fun goals and things that are happening over there, you can head to patreon.com slash sartorialgeek and we really, really appreciate you. Hey, welcome to the Sartorial Geek Podcast. I'm Jordan Ellis of Jordan Denae, and I am joined today by Ben Dobbins. Hello. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, so this... Okay, you're doing a lot of things that are really <laughs> cool, <laughs> but I'll let you, like, explain them um, because there's, like, so many different things happening that are really awesome. Yeah, no, I, for sure I'll jump in. Um, I also wanted to say, I was looking through the site, it looks like uh, we're both pretty significant fans of uh, A Darker Shade of Magic, so it's very excited oh to see that. Oh my gosh, yes we are. <laughs> so that <good>. is awesome. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, I've been able to work with uh, Victoria, and she's a a dream, and it's it's very very cool. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking through some of her other books recently, and saw this this piece at the top that said, uh, "If you like Diana Wynne Jones, who's my favorite all all time author," and I'd never made that connection, but she is so good at getting that sense of a magical world that we have access to. That's just kind of right around the corner from where we are, which I love. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad we have I'm glad we have that in common. That's setting this up to be a very good conversation. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So um, at kind of answering your question about where I've been, uh, I'm still super jet lagged. I just spent uh, six weeks uh, traveling around shooting movies. Uh, I was in Mongolia for a month and then uh, off to rapid fire visits to Australia and New Zealand. Um, ended up shooting footage off the back of a reindeer going over a mountain in northern Mongolia. So uh, so that's been my Whoa. life recently. That is maybe the most <laughs> exciting intro to this podcast we've ever had. That's wild. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it happened uh, because of a show we do called Strowlers, uh, which, which really kind of exists in, in a very similar aesthetic to, to the Darker Shades series. Uh, we're, you know, we start modern day, uh, magic exists. It, it, you're looking for the magic of, that's just right around the corner uh, and kind of then addressing how does this affect us in our everyday lives. So we put together uh, a pilot in Seattle, Washington, um, urban fantasy, uh, strongly influenced uh, by one of our, uh, a member of our writing team. Uh, we all kind of, the Black Lives Matter movement Black Lives Matter movement had really just uh, ramped up. And when a member of our writing team was talking about her fears for her son, who had just turned 13, looked 18, was worried about police violence. And we said, well, you, you know, urban fantasy is such an opportunity to talk about and look at real life issues kind of through through a slightly different perspective to, to be able to get people into and to empathize where otherwise they might knee jerk. So yeah. we so we did this pilot in in Seattle about uh, kids with magical powers and government regulation and and, and kind of the, these questions of systemic injustice and you know, who has access to education who has access to funding who doesn't and how and what happens to the people who fall through the cracks. So we made this. And uh, a friend of mine leaked an early copy to a group of shamans in Mongolia. And they saw this and said, holy crap, this is a, a show about magic users who are feared by the populace and they're oppressed by the government and they're, they're trying to find their own voice. This is us. You understand us. Why don't you come to Mongolia and let's shoot uh, 
a tie-in episode together. So we went to Mongolia oh. <laughs> and shot uh, an urban fantasy in Ulaanbaatar with, uh, with this group of shamans. That's uh, so wild. <laughs> uh, which really transformed the show from, hey, we're, we're based in Seattle to suddenly we're telling this global story. So we've since shot in Ireland. Uh, we have an episode that we just shot in Denmark uh, this spring. Uh, there's one coming up in New Zealand, but we ended up going back to Mongolia uh, this summer to shoot a second episode there, uh, which which was has just been this incredible, surreal, and amazing experience. So, are you are you in the show and right? Like, what's your role right. in in it? So, I'm effectively the showrunner, and the last thing okay. I ever need to do is appear on camera, uh, <laughs> especially if anyone's asking me to act. Uh, uh, I, I'm not interested in appearing on camera. I don't need to. Um, and also fair. because we're doing a show, it, it, it's, we're on Amazon prime now and our That's ratings, so awesome. our ratings tend to either be five star or one star where people are saying, Oh my, Oh my goodness. I see myself on screen uh, for the first time ever within this kind of fantasy context. You're speaking to my experience in a way that I've never seen before. Um, and then the other side, the one star reviews tend to be, uh, wait a second. So you have a protagonist who is a, uh, a lesbian woman of color. The villains are white people. You folks are horrible racists. I hate you forever. Why can't we have more shows with white protagonists? Oh, cool. Those are great reviews. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Or, I mean, yeah. at least you can feel great about like, it's like, okay, yeah, fine. I, I'll take the bad review if that's where we're, <laughs> that's I, I feel where we're really, coming from. Yeah. I feel super validated by the, uh, by the people we've managed to piss off with this show. Listen, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, I mean, a lot of things that are super specific, which like a lot of nerdy things tend to be like that makes them polarizing. Like you either love or hate it. And I think that makes a lot of sense that you found the people who love it and you're also going to find <laughs> the other side of it too. Well, and it's, it's allowed it to, to turn into kind of what each of the storytellers and the places that we go to, to kind of reflect the stories that could only be told there. Like when we were in uh, Denmark this spring, you know, uh, we're working with um, uh, a, a Danish Iranian guy um, uh, for the story team. Uh, we were working with uh, a guy who'd been a Bosnian war refugee who had landed in Denmark. And then another woman uh, who had, you know, uh, generations of Danish heritage and, Yes, we're telling an urban fantasy, but we kind of approached it from, wow, there's a lot going on in Denmark right now over the question of immigration and integration. And, and so asking those questions and kind of digging into what has the immigrant experience been? How are people connecting? Where are they connecting? Where is the fear coming from? Um, and within the context of we knew there was an election coming up there where you know the far right was really pushing for demonizing people. Uh, they have their own Danish uh, version of Trump who wants to put all the immigrants off on an island somewhere, sort of like how Australia has, has been doing it for decades. Um, you know, if, if we were going in saying... I've got to put myself on screen or I want to represent my perspective. We'd be totally missing out on these stories and these perspectives. And, and, it, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's this hyper local could only happen here story, but then told with this, you know, for a global audience. And that just hits all of my nerd buttons. Yeah. That's so cool. Wait, so do you have two separate shows on Amazon Prime? <laughs> uh, we have so much going on. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have Strallers, uh, which... Which is the one you've been talking about. Uh -huh. That's is right. Is that out yet? It is. We have three see? episodes okay. on Amazon. Uh, awesome. We have three more episodes in post. Um, I should also say everything that we do is 100% fan supported, which allows us to not have to listen to the... You, the notes in Hollywood where they say, I mean, great concept, but where's the white male point of view character so people can understand what's going on? 
That's wild. So your fan supported and on Amazon. That's right. So I didn't uh, even realize that was possible. That's very cool. Yeah, there's a program. So we upload to Amazon Prime ourselves. So we are okay. fully self-distributed. We're fully fan supported. And that means that that 100% independence allows us to tell the kinds of stories where you know, the networks of the studios would just say, what the hell? What yeah, are you trying totally. to do? Totally. Uh, yeah, so we have Strowlers. Uh, we have a, se- a show called Journey Quest uh, that is a fantasy comedy. It's been going since 2010. Uh, we just raised, I think, $442,000 on Kickstarter for the fourth season. 443, I'm looking at it right okay. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> uh, that is incredible. Uh, we have an ongoing series called The Gamers. Uh, the first of those was released back in 2002. And uh, so that's been uh, been kind of how we got our start and uh, has evolved with us uh, as storytellers. Uh, and then we run uh, in cooperation with uh, three other companies, a platform called the Fantasy Network, uh, where which we developed kind of as an alternative to all of these other kind of VOD services that all want to be walled gardens. Because uh, yeah. our whole idea is stories want to be free. How can we make them free? How can we make them available everywhere? So we give everything that we do away for free. Uh, we have uh, similar to a Creative Commons license. We let people remix. We let people create commercial derivatives. We let people create their own canon contributions to these shared wow. cinematic universes. Uh, so, so we And we've now built the Fantasy Network as a platform to support that. Uh, and what's been exciting has been bringing in now all of these other creators, indie creators from around the world with shows like AFK, uh, One Hit Die, Standard Action, uh, and and uh, the Rangers, the Mythica series, uh, to allow That's us to so cool. cross-pollinate and to support and to kind of take what's been working for us on Kickstarter and crowdfunding and help other people to do that as well. So uh, th- there's a whole lot of kind of ideology tied up in that where I want to s- want to s- want to take out the middlemen and allow fans to use that energy that they have to support what they love directly. That's so awesome. And that's so cool too. like to, to from the beginning, allow fans to like be a part of it. Cause that's not something that gets to happen a lot with like, fan stories a lot of the creators have like a pretty tight hold on ip for various reasons Mm -hmm. but then you know fans can't really interact other than just absorbing like they can't really be a part of it and that's a super cool way to do that that i have not really heard of that's awesome uh, yeah. If you're like me, I suspect you've spent a fair amount of time in the fan fiction communities. And yeah. there's so much energy and passion that people have for the stories that speak to them. And you know, a big part of the question we're asking we've asked and that's kind of motivated us is, you know, how how can we make this more of kind of an ongoing collaborative process? How can we recognize and support that kind of energy and passion instead of just you know coming down like a ton of bricks and saying, how dare you make a fan film or I can never read your fan fiction because I might get an idea and then there might be this copyright infringement or a lawsuit. So we spent a long time and working with our legal team to develop, uh, you know, an, an open license that would put all of us kind of on the same playing field and would allow stories to do what they're meant to do, which is, to reflect on each other and you know, to have a story that's a response to another story and stories are how we create culture. And the more that we can create the culture we want, the more we can kind of shift the world to be more of what we want it to be. You know, people talk about political change and we've got to elect the right politician, but the right politician is never going to do something if the culture isn't there to support them. So I, I just think that stories are so immensely powerful and, we have to have the opportunity to move away from kind of locking them into little boxes where people can't interact with them actively. Yeah. Are all the stories that you're telling right now, like video stories or are you doing other, like is, is all of this, are all of these (laughs) film things or are there other versions too? So film has been the 
the kind of the bedrock. It's where we've started. It's where we're, uh, we're most excited to work, but like with Strowlers, uh, we're slowly putting a, an anthology together, uh, oh, wow. a fiction from some of my favorite authors. Uh, there's a novel in progress, uh, for journey quest, uh, and for Strowlers, uh, and for uh, a show that we do called demon hunters, which is more of a horror comedy. Uh, we have world Bibles that have either been published or will be published soon. They give people access to the full thing, but they're also set up to allow people to role play within those worlds. So it, we're, we're seeing everything from role playing to, uh, to people designing other games, um, to working on fiction, uh, you know, in kind of ac- across the board. I'd, and it just comes down to where is the interest and where's the opportunity. That's so awesome. This is so cool. <laughs> I love every single thing about what you're doing. It's so awesome. So right now, are you, you're working on like getting the, the rest of the episodes for your current season up or like, what's your, I guess you just got back right. from like a wild <laughs> world tour filming that. Right. This, this kind of unbelievable, I mean, I could talk for hours just about this, this Mongolian experience of the last month there because there were so many surreal experiences, but you know, the, the big picture is um, you, we're still it, obviously from journey quest, you can see that we've built the fan base to the point where we can do a pretty massive Kickstarter campaign. Uh, we're yeah. still building the fan base for Strowlers. So my preference would be, be not to release these new episodes until uh, we're able to raise the money to continue the the kind of core Seattle story, which is what resonated with so many people. Um, and you know, these episodes abroad um, we do with a tiny team, and we're able to pull off on a pretty low budget. Uh, but we're going to have to raise more for the other ones. So really, I need to be out there spending less time shooting and more time. I don't know, making Facebook ads or something. I know the eternal creative struggle <laughs> of uh, taking the time to make the really awesome creative things be possible. I totally can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. So that that's, that's where we are with Strowlers. Uh, a lot of stuff in post, a lot of stuff in development, but you know, I'd, I'd love to get that Seattle, that next Seattle episode uh, produced so that when we release this next batch of episodes, people aren't saying, but what about these characters? I love them so much. Yeah. So where where are your fans hanging out? Like where, if someone is listening mm-hmm. and they're like, this sounds like everything I love. So one, <laughs> they can go to Amazon and watch everything. Right. Um, and then where else like are people hanging out online that are in your network? And For in sure. Your uh, so community. we have a, a core community on our Discord server, and all this oh, is linked cool. and available at strollers.com or zombieorpheus.com. Also, how do you spell Strollers? S T R O W L E R S. And okay, that was uh, my guess, yeah. but I wasn't sure if that was right. Cool. It, it, we were developing the show, and we discovered this word in a 17th century uh, dictionary of English thieves' cant. And it was the word that thieves used to refer to the people who moved in their similar circles who weren't thieves. The storytellers, the wandering puppeteers, the tinkers, uh, it, essentially the people who are creating culture on the fringes instead of uh, you know passively absorbing culture in the center. And we thought that was such a great way to think about what we wanted the show to be. Yeah. So That's so yeah, awesome. we have uh, we have Discord, we have a Facebook community. Uh, we we've put together something that we call the Strollers Backroom. Uh, it's still in beta, but it's kind of a, a full community that's set up with tons of piece, pieces integrated where people can coordinate and, and do events and share stories and be able to be a little more intentional about how information is managed instead of uh, kind of the constant feed of a Discord or Facebook where you see something and then a month later you can't find it again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we is. have that. And then we have uh, a shared wiki uh that we've set up for each of these cinematic universes where there oh, are a number cool. of pretty passionate, uh, passionate uh, fan contributors who are you know, adding to information there and we're getting information in there to, to try to make that all available. That's awesome. And then is it like, 
do you do like a Kickstarter for every season or how, how has Kickstarter and like the crowdfunding or the fan mm-hmm. funding part worked into um, like production and all of that? So typically, yes. Anytime we want to do a show, we do a Kickstarter. Our, our, our whole theme is no studio, no network, no cancellation. Uh, and that's kind of the commitment that we've made to the fan base. And, but it's really a double edged sword. It's, it means that if it, it's up to the fans whether we are canceled or renewed. So you, know, so, you know, we've had a few shows over the years that where we've kickstarted them, they haven't made it. And we've had to say, okay, we don't have the support to continue this show or this story. And then we've had things like Journey Quest where people step up in a really major way to keep it going. So Kickstarter has been a huge part of it. I have my issues with Kickstarter. I, I really believe that how platforms are created creates culture around them. We see that around you know, all the social media and how how it's created a culture that's really uh, cultivated fascism, which isn't cool. Uh, yeah. And you know, Kickstarter creates a culture uh, around, you know, it, it's become all about the merch and all about the pre-orders yeah. and less about the passion for the story and the show. So yeah, we, we use Kickstarter for just about everything, but I have a very uneasy relationship with them because I feel like at a core level, they're doing something that doesn't quite match what we want to do, which is to empower people to support these stories directly and not be as worried as much and not to worry as much about where am I going to get, you know, how am I going to get $500 worth of merchandise? Uh, That's good. It's been sit on my shelf forever and I'll never touch it again. That's the hard thing about like uh, on the podcast and in my life, I talk to a ton of creators and like our, our team is a lot of creators and artists. And it's, it's a really, really hard thing to figure out where like so much is free, like so much content is free or, and so much entertainment is free. But then there's the reality, like you're talking about that if you, if you want the things that you care about to happen, they have to be funded some way. So they're Mm -hmm. either funded from investors or whatever, and then they get a say in what happens. Or if you want something that is like purely fan for fans and fan created, and you have creative control, like then people have to step up and fund it. And that's a hard sell sometimes. So I totally hear what you're saying that it's like, you know, the balance of, trying to figure out how to make that happen without doing what you're saying, which is like basically just selling merch to fund it, Mm -hmm. which understand. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, It's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation for like for creators and fans to figure out how to, how to work together now. So a lot of, a lot of what we do kind of came out of experiences that we had in uh, 2008 we released our first big feature film. We had a Hollywood distribution. It came out in August of 2008. It made a lot of money for them. The economy crashed in a major way. We never saw uh, all the money that it made. Um, and I got really fascinated kind of by not only what went wrong on the film side, where we had a success with a movie that we're now self-distributing that we're hopefully going to finish paying off this year, more than a decade later. Um, but also kind of looking on the macro scale at what are what's going on economically. And it, it created a huge transition for us from thinking in terms of unit sales to creating sustaining communities. And, and I think that, that that's tied in in many ways to kind of, I'm, I'm going to kind of go far afield here, but you, you look at, the places in Europe where austerity hit so hard that people couldn't support each other via kind of traditional methods. And so started creating collectives and cooperatives, uh, e- even on the scale of entire towns. And my, my feeling is that we're, we're kind of operating in this uneasy space where we're a hybrid of what we have to do for capitalism to meet certain thresholds, but also thinking of for the future about you know, how, how and what kinds of communities are we, uh, are, are we building for when money isn't available? 
And I'm just fascinated mm -hmm. by that question. And we, we explore that within our shows, but we also explore that kind of within the, the economic models that we use to fund our shows where we don't start with how much money do we need? We start with what can we, can, what can we accomplish as a community and how can we working together, uh, you know, achieve these collective goals? Yeah, that's so, yeah, that's, that is, it's awesome that it's working too. Like it's very, it's a, you know, it's a huge testament to the, the community that, community that you're building that you've been able to do all of this that's really really awesome it's it's very easy to have a whole lot of cynicism about human nature and and i think the big radical thing that we do with all of these shows that we create is we start from the perspective of we're going to put we're going to gift this story to the world and then we're going to trust in the goodwill of strangers to help continue to support it, which, which to me at times that feels very radical, especially, you know, with the situation you know, we're in politically right now in so many countries around the world. Um, it's, you know, we don't need to get too far into that, but you know, yeah, there's a whole a lot of very long conversation, yeah. but <laughs> we, we all know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it feels like, like my own kind of, small, quiet, personal rebellion to, to say, I'm going to trust in the goodwill of strangers and we're, we're going to get people to work together and w see what we can do communally. And to have that work is, you know, help helps get me through the day on the, on the really difficult news days. No, totally. I mean, it's, it's been very cool to see, like, there are a lot of companies that I've and artists and creators that I've talked to on the podcast who all or part of their business is like basically like I'm going to prove that I can do this thing that whoever is telling me I can't either investors or society or you know mm -hmm. whatever it, it is like it's like a mini form of rebellion that's you doing something that shouldn't maybe be possible or isn't the way things work. And I, I think that's awesome. And it's really cool to see how many people are able to do that. It's inspiring. Well, and that's, that's the part that just inspires me on a regular basis too, is, is seeing how, like you said, how many people are, are finding the models that don't fit the conventional wisdom at all. And but and that, that and those that those models create community, mm -hmm. right? That they create connection. Yeah, because it's so easy to feel kind of alone and isolated. Yeah, I love that. Well, we've we've been talking about this the whole <laughs> the whole time, but where, what is the best way for someone to support what you're doing? Like where, what are the steps to like getting involved um, and like keeping, mm -hmm. keeping the stories that you're telling going and, and being a part of the community that you've been talking about? Like where, where do people start? So for the people who have kind of the capacity, uh, I would say the, the core community really happens on discord now. That's awesome. And, and that's where you know, our, our creators and our, our cast and our, our team kind of interact on a daily basis with the fans. So, um, so that's a very easy way to do it. Uh, beyond that, we have a strong Facebook community, but of course it's Facebook. So there's always the, yeah. the crapshoot. Will they show you when, uh -huh. when you send yep. an update? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the wiki, uh, it's a much smaller community there, but the people are, who are doing it are very passionate. So there's a fair amount of discussion. Uh, this backroom.strollers.com, uh, like I said, it's in beta, but it is there and we're, we're hoping to grow that. So I would, I would kind of look at those places. Uh, and then, of course, finding us at conventions. Um, and also, uh, we have, I think, three weekly shows uh, that broadcast uh, – on Twitch oh, uh, cool. from, from our studio too. So if, if people are into kind of the live role play, uh, we do 
we do very, very live, very interactive, uh, and have built a lot of cool relationships there. That's awesome. And then we can link, we can send out links, uh, in the show notes that people can just can yeah. scroll through and check out. And then I'm assuming when you do your Kickstarter campaigns or your funding campaigns, you post in all of those places. We do. And occasionally people even see the posts. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I mean, lots of people uh, found the last one, which is incredible. I think that's the biggest Kickstarter I've ever seen personally, which is very, very cool. Lots of people found it. And then a lot of people didn't find it and discovered it afterward and sent us angry messages saying, why didn't you promote this? <laughs> that's my favorite thing when you're like, oh, well, I sure did. So I'm so sorry that you missed it. <laughs> yeah. And un unfortunately, uh, we, we can't reach all people at all the time. Uh, so, you know, yeah, no, that's it, a great it, it, position yeah. to be in though. People want more of your marketing messages. That, uh, that right. is great news. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's essentially it. Um, I, I will say for, for people who might want to watch on Amazon, we're, we're only on Amazon in the U S and UK, uh, okay. but you can watch all of our shows for free. I, I think 95% of them are for free worldwide on the fantasy network. Uh, there's an optional $5 a month subscription for people who want to help support all of the shows that they're watching. Uh, and that money goes straight to the creators. Um, but we have apps on iOS, Android, Xbox now, uh, oh. Roku. Uh, so it's really easy. You can watch and stream. Uh, you can get it on your TV. And it's a great way to see uh, works from just brilliant creators all over the world who are kind of exploring their singular voices. And then, uh, and then to decide, you know, wow, I'm a huge fan of this. How could, and have a direct way to be able to support to support those creators and allow them to the resources to keep telling their stories. Yeah. That's super awesome. I'm excited to go like spend this weekend <laughs> catching up on some of these shows. That's so cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it, not every show is for every person, but I'm immensely proud of, of what our creators and storytellers and, and communities have been able to create. Uh, it's just, it's such a gift to be able to, to do this. That's so awesome. Thank you so much for, for talking to me and like talking through all of this. And I'm excited. I'd love to have you back in the future. Cause there will be even more amazing stories happening by then. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. I feel like this is definitely a space to watch, <laughs> which is really awesome. No, for sure. Um, and I'm going to get off this call and go order one of those darker shade t-shirts. So oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> so next time we chat, I can be wearing that. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And please, everyone go check out. We'll, we'll leave links to everything. And then, you know, you can check out uh, the ways that you want to get involved. But um, this has been super cool. Thank you all so much for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. Stay nerdy. Bye. Bye.